When the world thinks of referees, they often think of officious dunderheads that are a necessary evil. And while the necessary evil part may be true, it's because players, regardless of the sport, can't or won't agree to call the same thing. Most of the time, it's because they see things from their own perspectives and they need an unbiased third party, meaning us, to make those decisions. So, agree with us or not, referees are necessary, and in roller derby, strangely appreciated. Not only are most of us affiliated with a league, but we attend practices with skaters and even party with them after bouts. You don't see that happening with other sports. And most of the time, it lets players appreciate us as human beings rather than just jerks and stripes. But yet, friends or not, we're still tasked with laying down the law, and there are occasions where that authority is blatantly disregarded. Insubordination calls are calls that make us look like jerks. But on the other hand, it can keep things from getting much, much worse. It's a double-edged sword and needs to be applied evenly, with precision, and with understanding. In this presentation, I hope to give you an idea of just how to do that. Before I get to the standard disclaimers, I need to add one additional item. This module uses adult language and video examples of violence. It also contains editorial content by me, which you may or may not agree with. But with regards to the language and violence, please use discretion before showing this to a minor. Before we begin, however, I'd like to give you some fair warning. This presentation is not the official word from the WFTDA or MRDA. I am a level 4 referee with the WFTDA, but I am not working for them, and this has no official approval from them. I'm just a guy who wants to help out. And like anything that doesn't come with a WFTDA or MRDA seal of approval, take with an appropriate level of salt. In an effort to keep this presentation as correct as possible, I'm including the date that this presentation was recorded. In the event that I need to update the presentation due to something that was clarified or just out and out wrong, this date will change and there will be an update in the change log that's listed with the presentation on refed.com. The date of this recording is February 20, 2015, and there have been no updates since the original presentation was released. There are basically three different types of insubordination calls. The first is for failing to leave the track after a penalty. The second is for failing to leave the track immediately after being called for a penalty. There is a difference. And the third is for inappropriate behavior directed at an official. We're going to start with failing to leave the track immediately after being called for a penalty because it's something that's called incredibly inconsistently. This is a combination of Rule 5.14.2, willfully failing to leave the track for a penalty, and 6.2.2, when a skater is sent to the penalty box, the skater must immediately exit the track to the appropriate direction. Simply put, if a skater is called on a penalty, she must, at the first available opportunity, exit to the safety lane of the track on the way to the penalty box. Do not pass go, do not collect $200, and do not cut short the distance to the penalty box. The most obvious call of this nature is when the player hears the call, does something to acknowledge the call, and then totally disregards the call, possibly to perform another block. In that situation, it should be a pretty easy insubordination call. But what about if the player acknowledges the call, but just doesn't exit the track properly? This isn't just me being an officious jerk. This is a thing, and there is a reason why some skaters do it that way. So let's look at how it should be done. In this series of diagrams, the yellow pivot is called for a penalty, exits the track, and skates in the safety lane to the penalty box on the other side of the track. This is where not being overly officious comes into play. Let's say that the yellow pivot exits at an angle like in this diagram. Has she cut some of the track? Yes. But is it an unreasonable amount? No. 
We're not asking players to stop, make a 90 degree turn and exit. They can use their natural momentum and exit the track as long as there's not a substantial amount of track cut by it. So what's substantial? In this diagram, let's say the yellow pivot was just called for penalty. Notice that she's just entered turn three and has no obstructions on the way to the safety lane. But instead of exiting the track, she sprints ahead of everyone, taking the inside line of the track and then exits immediately in front of the penalty box. This is a penalty for failing to exit the track. Here's the trick. There is no specific metric. We're only trying to get the blatant offenders, so there is a fair amount of wiggle room where that yellow pivot could have exited and not be called for a penalty. Is it a penalty if the pivot makes a straight line and exit at the apex between turns three and four? Probably. But we shouldn't call a penalty on a probably. We're looking for a definite. And in this case, the pivot has made a conscious decision by turning inside on her trip to the penalty box to cut that lap time short. I also want to add this part in. If a player can't get to the outside of the track, she can't be called for an insubordination penalty. Let's say the purple pivot in this diagram has been called for a penalty. She's surrounded by other players and has no open avenue to exit the track. While this does not mean she can still block, she is allowed to stay on the track until a pathway opens. Most players will slow down and try to get around all the other players since they're not effective teammates if their penalty time is being prolonged by being pinned up. I realize that this particular call has caused bees to go up some people's butts. And I understand their arguments that should a player skate through both turns on the way to the box, there's no impact on other players. But I've made this call in the WFTDA playoffs, in front of board members, in front of referee certification members, in front of tournament head referees, and the message I've consistently gotten back is that this is the correct call. My counter-argument to the there is no impact group is that the penalty starts upon the call, and part of that penalty is the trip to the penalty box. If not, why do we make people who skate past the penalty box take another lap? Because going to the box and going into it legally is part of the rules and part of the penalty. More importantly, it's a part that the skaters, and this has been happening for quite a while now, have approved. Therefore, taking that quick path rather than the legal path to the penalty box is shortening that skater's penalty. And until we're told to do otherwise, we should be calling that as insubordination. The trick for referees now is to call it consistently in every game in order for those same skaters to evaluate it properly. The second part of the insubordination rule addresses a problem that referees have been having for a long time, which is how many times should a referee call out a penalty to a skater who doesn't recognize it before they need to call the additional insubordination? Rule 5.14.3 lays down some ground rules. The penalty must be called using the correct hand signal and the correct verbal cue. And the referee must be in the correct position for the skater to see that penalty being issued. Which means if you're an outside pack ref and the skater has just moved 20 feet in front of you, you need to adjust yourself for that call, not the skater. And finally, the verbal call must be of a reasonable volume. I have yet to see any official issue a penalty on this after calling the penalty once, and I hope never to. This is something that you as a referee must make a best effort at, and only when there's nothing more to be done. When you're at risk of being neglectful of your other duties, should you pull that trigger and make the call. This is something that you should be expected to be asked about about why you made the insubordination call, and you should be able to relay exactly what you did and how many times before you had to move up to the next level of enforcement. 
The final insubordination call is because someone is being a jerk to you. Sooner or later, any referee finds out that in order to do our job correctly, we have to do things that aren't always popular. They may think they've been aggrieved, that you have it out for them, or whatever. It doesn't give them the right to spout off on you. If this is a WFTDA or MRDA sanctioned or regulation game, there are grievance procedures they can follow. If it's an internal league game, there should be internal grievance procedures as well. I'm going to editorialize a bit more here. I refereed soccer for nine years before I took up roller derby. I'm now at the point where last year I didn't do a single soccer game because I'm too invested in derby. I'm paying a couple thousand dollars in travel expenses a year where before I'd make a few thousand. I love soccer, have done since I first watched the Minnesota Strikers in the original NASL in 1984. But the governing bodies of soccer, from FIFA to the national federations to the local organizations, have done an awful job protecting referees. And it comes from the top down. FIFA lets it go, then the USSF lets it go, and then it works its way down all the way to the youth and adult recreational levels. And the end results are situations like these.
powerful moment on a Utah soccer field, shining a real spotlight on the treatment of referees. A ref making a call, then punched by a team player, and the referee died. Tonight, many are asking, should this be a wake-up call for escalating behavior on the field? Here's ABC's John Schriffen tonight. It should have been like any other rec league soccer game. But when referee Ricardo Portillo called a foul on a 17-year-old goalie on this Utah field, the player flew into a rage, then punched the 46-year-old father in the face when he wasn't looking. It's just not fair. We're all there to have fun, not to go and kill each other. The father of three later slipped into a coma and late last night passed away. His family left wondering how it could have happened, demanding justice. If he spends time in jail like forever, it's not enough. They're not going to bring my daddy back. This is certainly not the first time a referee has been assaulted. Take a look at this youth football game in Miami. A coach slaps an official so hard he falls to the ground. And this referee in Florida suffered a broken shoulder after being slammed into the turf by a player. David recently met one college student who quit his job as a soccer ref for kindergartners after the coach and some of the parents were just too abusive. The coach would yell at me, like scream at me in front of the children, like kindergartners. So he'd be like, profanities. Yeah. In America, we challenge authority, and sports reflects that. Parents need to teach their kids impulse control and moral behavior and right and wrong, and coaches have to get behind that also. And that teen from Utah who allegedly threw the punch has been booked at a juvenile detention center on suspicion of aggravated assault. And because their referee passed away, David, that 17-year-old now faces additional, more serious charges. Referees and NSOs in roller derby have a much closer relationship to players than in any other sport and have, for the most part, not had these kinds of incidents because we're more than just the bastard in black. We're members of that same skaters league. We're people they see two to three times a week. And even if we're not on the same league, our community is small enough that chances are we'll see each other again sometime soon. As a soccer referee, I've seen grown adults hurl vile insults to 12 year olds. I've had to call 911 on multiple occasions for my own safety and I've run onto the fields of other referees to protect them from other people. So if I sound a little impassioned about keeping decorum and decency and respect for officials in roller derby, it's because I have a history of seeing when there's nothing done at the institutional level. And I think we as a roller derby community have done better than them, but we also need to stay vigilant so we don't slide. Okay, editorial mode disabled. As referees, we need to be able to tell the difference between what is directed towards an official and what is directed towards the incident. The easiest rule of thumb for this is, is the word you involved? Someone just called for a back block may yell fuck because they keep getting called on it. But if that changes to fuck you, then we have an insubordination. The former is not a penalty, just an expletive. The latter is a comment about the officiating or about the official personally and is a penalty. However, the word you does not have to be explicitly said. I had a skater who I called for a clockwise block at the end of a jam, respond to a teammate's question who asked what he was called on, start with the direction of gameplay hand signal, and then finished it with a masturbatory gesture. As anyone who's deaf will tell you, language doesn't have to involve vocal cords. A second penalty should be added. Similarly, directed at an official, which is a phrase used in the rules, doesn't have to be directed to an official. Someone making public, obscene, profane, or abusing comments about the officiating to fans is still insubordination. Two more things before we finish up the presentation. The first is to not go overboard. Roller derby is a physically demanding sport, and the players are passionate. 
they're not always going to agree with our calls. Disagreeing with our calls is not insubordination. It's having an opinion. Failure to go to the boxes directed or being abusive to us is insubordination. But shaking their head at us, giving us a death stare, or yelling that they didn't do the penalty is not insubordination. Those are opinions about the call or opinions about us, and they are entitled to them. In fact, I'm perfectly happy with any of those happening after I make a penalty call, as long as they still go to the penalty box without crossing that line into obscenity, profanity, or abusiveness. The second and final thing I want to caution us about is almost the opposite of my last point. It is to not let things go because they don't piss us off. Official retention in all sports is pretty appalling, and roller derby requires a lot of officials if we want to fully staff a game. Call things to the rules, not your own personal tolerance level. As a referee of more than 15 years, I have a pretty thick skin. But what should be the most important skill a referee should have? Is it how well the ref can take abuse or how well that ref actually officiates? What we allow in sanctioned games works its way down to interleague play and juniors. Set the bar appropriately. I'd like to thank Neil Gunner and Pre-Flash Gordon for permission to use their photos in this presentation. I'd like to thank the Vienna Roller Derby for their permission to use their Ultimate Roller Derby Ubiquitous Magnet Board for this presentation. It can be found at viennarollerderby.org slash urdumb. If you found this presentation helpful, or think it or other presentations at refed.com might be helpful to others, please share this site but please do not modify it or send it out without appropriate credit for its production. This presentation is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License.